The scripture concerning the fig tree is one that is quite familiar to everyone. We know that Jesus was with his disciples. We know that he turned and looked the distance and saw a tree that was full of leaves. And what you have to know about a fig tree is when a tri fig tree is full of leaves, there's an indication that fruit should be there because the fruit is there first and then the leaves come second. So if it's full of leaves, then there's an indication that there should be figs accompanying those leaves. But when Jesus got to the tree, he recognized that there was no fruit at all in the tree. And what we have to understand is, as I began to try to figure out why would Jesus curse a tree, because also in the chapter it says that it wasn't the season for figs. And when I looked that up, because I've seen it and I've read it over and over again, and I thought, well, I'm sure Jesus knew that it wasn't a season for figs. But when I went back to look at the translation, because, you know, translation is everything. When I went to look back a, up a Hebrew translation, it really doesn't mean that it wasn't a season for figs. What it means is that the figs that were going to market weren't ripe yet. They weren't ripe yet. And we also, and I also learned that the fig tree was a representative of the nation of Israel. It represented Israel. And the reason that Jesus cursed the tree is because the tree was impersonating something that was full, and it wasn't. See, he created that tree, and in the seed was everything it needed to be what it was supposed to be. And so when he looked at it being full grown, and he walked up to it, and it had the leaves like it was supposed to have, and it grew up like it was supposed to do, but it didn't have the fruit, he had an issue with that because what God created, he doesn't have to do. Do you understand that? What he creates, he doesn't have to do. So what we have to realize about that fig tree is not only does it represent the nation of Israel, it really represents the people of today. We're walking around with our fig leaves, covering up things, making it look like we're something we're not. And it's not until people closely examine us that they realize we don't have the fruit that we act like we have. The title of this message is, Don't Become a Spiritual Ornament. Don't become a spiritual ornament. Now, ornament defined is a thing used to make something look more attractive, but usually having no practical purpose. When I think about that, most of us have Christmas trees. And what I find interesting about that is it's a tree from January to November. In December, it becomes a Christmas tree. And then we buy decorations to put on this tree to make it look better, to make it look more festive. But it's still just a tree. It's still just a tree. Now, it serves its purpose. But we, as the body of Christ, were created from the beginning to be more than that. And when we walk around with our fig leaves, pretending that we're something we're not, that's offensive to God. That means that we're living beneath our privilege. That means that we are making a decision in a lot of instances not to be and do all that God created us to do. And if we are really children of God, that is not an option. That is not an option. 
I want to give you about four signs that you are or becoming a spiritual ornament. Four signs that you may be becoming a spiritual ornament. You could be a spiritual ornament if you attend church, but you won't invite anyone or give anyone a ride to church. Everybody knows you go to church, but you don't invite anybody because you don't care about anybody else's soul but yours. You don't take the time to invite someone because they might see, be, they might see under those fig leaves that you have. Point number two, you might be a spiritual ornament if you are a faithful tither, but you won't help somebody in need. See, I read in my word that there are some Pharisees in the Bible that were really big on tradition. And they went to the synagogue, which is the same thing as our ch a church, every day. They were faithful tithers all the time down to the penny. They were faithful tithers. But when it came to helping somebody else who didn't look like them, they cut them off. They totally ignored them. Now their fig leaf, that church going fig leaf, that I give my money to the church fig leaf would indicate that there's something they are not. And just like in the word, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, when I looked up that Hebrew word for curse, it means judge. So he judged the nation of Israel by cursing that tree to let them know all of this outward stuff that you're doing, that you think is religious, that you think is, is impressive to me, is trash to me because I see your hearts. I see up one of those fig trees, fig leaves that you have. A third indication that you may be becoming a spiritual ornament is if you have graduated the vision of this church, you don't want to serve anywhere, but you complain about how things are run at the church. You are a spiritual ornament. See, we have a choice about that. We have a choice. Just like the fig tree, we, we, we were created to be fruitful. And when we choose not to be fruitful, then we have to receive the consequences of choosing not to be fruitful. There are consequences to that. And lastly, you may be becoming a spiritual ornament if you have an earthly title, but you don't have a lick of spiritual power. You can't pray to tick off a dog. See, a lot of us are impressed by the titles of people, but we can't pray. We can't pray for them because we don't have a prayer life. But people think that fig leaf called church attendance covers that. That fig leaf called tithing covers that. And even that fig leaf that gives you a title in the church, some people think that covers that, but it does not. Just because you do all those things does not mean that you are fruitful. And as a body of Christ, we are called to be fruitful. This is what God is looking for. God is looking for fruit bearers, not spiritual ornaments. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit, the result of his presence within us is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while we are waiting. 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. There should be a demonstration of your fruit before you open your mouth. If you have to tell somebody, yes, I have peace, yes, I'm, I'm meek, yes, I'm, I'm kind, yes, I'm, I know how to wait, yes, I have patience, yes, I am, I'm unselfish. If you have to verbally tell somebody that, then you don't have any fruit. They should be able to see that. They should be able to feel that. There should be something distinct about you as a child of God. There should be something distinct about you that says you have fruit. There should be something. And I don't mean the fish on your car or the cross around your neck or the Bible on your desk at work. I'm not talking about any of that. There should be something about your behavior. Pastor talks about an aroma. You should have an aroma if you're being fruitful, if you really care about being fruitful. I remember when I was leading a 12 at Greenwood Christian Center, and I had an older lady that was in my 12, and when she first came in, she was very adamant about what she was not going to do. And when you are working with older people, you have to make an adjustment to your response, to your facial expressions, because God loves them as much as he loves you. And she repeatedly told me, I'm not going to class, I'm not buying a book, I'm not staying in here. I'm not listening to you. And I just nodded and smiled every time she told me what she was not going to do. But she kept showing up. she come every week. She may not say anything, but she come every week, and then eventually she started talking. And eventually she decided she would go to class. Because, you know, one thing about winning people over is you got to connect with them before you try to correct somebody. You gotta connect before you correct. You gotta earn the right to speak into somebody's life. You have to earn that. We kept talking and she kept coming and she eventually went through all of the classes and she stayed with me for a while. She stayed in my 12 for a while and one day I had a car accident and uh, I had to put my car in the shop and uh, I was without a vehicle, and I was waiting on uh, the deductible. Because sometimes, you know, paying that deductible is a, is a bear. Anyway, I was trying to figure out how to pay my deductible, and one day she showed up at my house with this envelope with $500 cash in it. I didn't tell her what my deductible was. I didn't tell her. I didn't even, she didn't even know I had a need, but God did, God did. And because of the fruit, because of the way that I treated her, because I displayed the fruit that's in the word of God to this woman, because I did that, God rewarded me with something that I needed. God rewarded me. See, if I had responded to her like she responded to me, yeah, 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 yeah. we both would have missed out because she wouldn't have got blessed and I wouldn't have got blessed. It's so important, it's so important to bear fruit because you never know who that's going to affect and how that's going to affect them. And sometimes you only get one opportunity. You only get one chance to do it right. You can always go back and apologize, but a lot of times people are gonna remember that first, that first encounter with you. So don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Number two, bearing fruit means to produce what you are connected to, which is Christ. Reproducing the same quality and substance, which means that if you claim to have the fruits of the Spirit, 
kindness and goodness and faithfulness. That means you just can't be faithful when it's convenient for you. That means that you can't just exercise self-control when it's to your benefit. That means that you can't just be kind to people who can do something for you later. It means that you have to operate in peace when somebody has just cursed you out. It means that you can't be selfish. It means that you have to be sincerely and authentically joyful for somebody who's, been, who's received something that you've been praying for for a long time. See, these things are all fruits of the Spirit. They're all fruits of the Spirit, and they're all important. John 15 and 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For otherwise, apart from me, that is cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. And I don't know about you, but even though I've read that scripture before, there have been times when I have tried to see if that was true. You know, where you try to do things on your own, you try to make things happen. And God will let you get so far, he'll let you get out far enough to where you can't get back. And I'm grateful that he didn't leave me. I'm grateful that he did not leave me at the place that I stopped listening. I am grateful. I am grateful. I am so very grateful. I'm so grateful. Now, as I was studying this, I, every time I teach, it always makes me look at me because I think it's hypocritical to teach something and not look at yourself first. It's hypocritical. It really is. And every time I teach, you know, God reveals some area as it should be, and it's okay. Because we should be open to that. He reveals some area that I need to work on. And I'm, and I'm grateful for that. I'm very grateful for that. And I realized as he was talking about the leaves... I realize that there are areas that, even in leadership, that I could do better, that I could change. Because when I come up, those attached to me are going to come up. When I make a change, those attached to me are going to make a change. But if I choose to stay where I'm at, if I choose to stay on the level that I'm on, I have no right to expect others, more of others than I am of myself. That's the, that's the bottom line. We don't have a right to do that. We do not have a right to do that. And that's all, also as I studied this, I began to look at which of these fruits is my jar not quite full in. Because if we're really honest, with ourselves, I mean really honest with ourselves, there's probably some space in each one of these fruits. There's space, there's, there's room to grow, there's room to be challenged in all of these. There is. One of my areas that I'm gonna share is Probably patience. Patience. Because I like to see people grow. I like to see people grow. And one of the things that I have learned about me is, you know, your clock is different than God's clock. And even when you're encouraging and even when you're walking with people, just because you think somebody should be in a certain place at a certain time does not mean that that's God's timetable. So I have learned to ask God, is this, is this just me 
because I know I'm in people's life to, to encourage and challenge, but am I on your clock or am I on my clock? And I find myself having to ask that quite a bit just because I like to see people grow and I love to see people challenge themselves. I mean, that, that's important. That is so very important. As I stand here before you, talking about the fruits of the Spirit, talking about and sharing what my area, and that's not the only area, but in sharing my areas, I would ask you the same question. Are you willing to look at yourself? I mean, really look at yourself, not be so concerned about how it looks on the outside, not be so concerned about what position you hold in the ministry, not be concerned about who you are on your job or who you are with the person sitting next to you. But what parts of your life, really, what parts of your life do you still need to work on? Does everybody, does everybody know in your life that you're a child of God? Is, there, is it a secret? Is it a secret? If your friends from work and your friends from church and your street friends all got together and sat down and talked about you, would they be talking about the same person? Would there be any, any connecting conversation? Would your party friend know that you went to church? Would your church friend know that you still party? See, we all got pockets. We all have pockets. And we all have areas that we can grow and bear more fruit in. Because if you're not bearing fruit, just like Jesus did, we're all going to get cut off. We're, we're, we're going to get caught off, cut off. We are. We are. Because really in this chapter, uh, God was warning the Israelites again. He said, you, you, you say that you love me, but you don't obey me. Everything you're doing is outward. It's trying to impress other people but your, I don't have your heart. I don't have your heart. We had a license and ordination meeting this past week and uh, some of us were sharing how we, even though we've come this far, we've come, graduated from MIT and some of us are going to be licensed and some of us are going to be ordained. We were sharing that at some point we still don't quite feel qualified to do, to go to that next level and do what God is calling us to do. And as we were sharing that, I heard God say, well, how would you know if you were qualified or not? How would you know? These are my standards. These are not your standards. And even the word talks about that man looks outward, but God looks at the heart. He said, it's your heart that qualifies you, not your works. It's your heart that qualifies you. So for those of you who don't feel qualified to go to the next level, to do whatever it is that God is calling you to do, who feel like you don't quite measure up. If your heart is right before God, you are qualified. You are qualified. You are qualified. You are qualified. What evidence do you have that there's fruit in your life? That's my question for everybody. What evidence? 
do you have that there is fruit in your life? What's your evidence? What's your evidence? I mean, if you thought about that, what is your evidence? I heard a question that said, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would it be, or would you, or would you get off scot-free? That's something to think about. That's lifestyle. That's fruit. It's about bearing the fruit that God says that we're supposed to bear. And that fruit includes the Holy Spirit. And you can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Some of us are trying to live with God, live for God without the Holy Spirit. Talent will never be enough. It'll never be enough. You will never know enough people. You will never have enough money. You will never have enough things. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you got nothing. You have nothing. You have nothing. Absolutely nothing. I want to take this opportunity, since we're winding down, I want to take this opportunity and challenge you to, number one, think about, do you have the fruits of your spirit in your life? Do you have areas that you need to grow in? And please be authentic about it. I mean, whether you decide to sit in your chair or come to the altar, that has nothing to do with me because I'm not judge or jury. But if God is speaking to you and you have areas in your life that he needs to fix so you can go deeper in him, so you can go higher in him, then let him do that. Don't wait until some catastrophic event happens and then you have to cry out to God for him to get your attention. Don't wait until he has to get your attention. 